Hi everyone, my name is Steve House and today I'm going to tell you the story of climbing K7. More precisely, I'm going to tell you the story of the, the first experience with climbing K7, kind of discovering the Characusa Valley and uh, doing some other climbing there and kind of unlocking what would come to be the key to climbing this mountain. I'm going to start today because we're doing this story, this may get lost, I'm recording this, and this may get lost in, um, in the years to come as, as this will probably live on YouTube for a while. Uh, we are in the midst of the, the coronavirus crisis right now, the pandemic, and that has been a big part of what has prompted this, um, this series of story times. So today, like last time, I want to start with a quote. And this is a message from a, a person named White Eagle from the Hopi Nation, and this was sent out on the 16th of March, 2020. Today it's uh, early April, 2020. And he or she said, White Eagle said, this moment humanity is going through can now be seen as a portal and as a whole. The decision to fall into the hole or go through the portal is up to you. If you repent of the problem and consume the news 24 hours a day with little energy, nervous all the time, with pessimism, you will fall into the hole. But if you take this opportunity to look at yourself, to rethink life and death, to take care of yourself and others, you will cross the portal. Take care of your home, take care of your body, connect with your spiritual house. Body, house, spiritual house, all this is synonymous, that is to say the same. When you are taking care of one, you are taking care of everything else. Do not lose the spiritual dimension of this crisis. Have the aspect of the eagle, which sees from above, sees the whole, sees more widely. There is a social demand in this crisis, but there is also a spiritual demand. The two go hand in hand. Without the social dimension, we fall into fanaticism. Without the spiritual dimension, we fall into pessimism and a lack of meaning. You were prepared to go through this crisis. Take your toolbox and use all the tools at your disposal. Learn about resistance from the indigenous and African peoples. We have been and always will be persecuted, but we haven't stopped singing, dancing, lighting a fire and having fun. Don't feel guilty about being happy during this difficult time. You don't help at all by being sad and without energy. It helps if good things emanate from the universe now. It is through joy that one resists. So I chose that actually because it really has a lot to do with the theme of this whole climb of K7. Because for me, climbing this mountain wasn't kind of a, a physical act. It wasn't a, a act of, of sport, let's say. It was really a spiritual journey for me. And I mean that in the most profound sense. This, this was a time in my life where I, I was not sure of who I was or who I was becoming, who I wanted to be. Um, and I found this incredible valley and I found this incredible peace, both at place in the valley and in the process of, of climbing K7. And so I want to say that uh, this process, this uh, climb of K7, which spanned a couple of years, is in my mind today, looking back now, you know, 16 years, is the, probably the most cherished experience in all of my climbing. And uh, so I'm going to share that with you today, or the first part of it. So this is the summit of K7, the high summit on, on the right, and uh, you'll get, uh, I'll take us through the, the geography of the mountain more and more as we go through. But I'm going to just back up and, and remind us that uh, in 2003, I went to Masherum, tried to climb this peak behind Marco Prezel and I. Uh, we wanted to climb, I think you can see my, my pointer here, we wanted to climb this, this ridge and pillar feature that descended basically here, some, somewhere along this type of, 
of line. Maybe we go here. We weren't exactly sure. Maybe we come up here. This is what I call the, the northwest pillar. Uh, this, this face is north, northeast. Uh, this section of the wall right here that you can see, and you'll see in other pictures, actually overhangs the extremely steep uh, face. Beautiful, beautiful mountain, just under 8,000 meters and only been climbed a couple of times. Uh, Marco and I were with this uh, third uh, climbing partner, Matiz Yost, who was pictured there with Marco at, at base camp. This was our, our one of our early attempts packing, packing up in the, in the cook tent. So as I said in the last talk, I went through this story of, of attempting Mash for Brome, and we had a lot of kind of dangerous days, probably what I consider my most dangerous expedition because we had a, lot, uh, a buried surface horror layer uh, and that was very sensitive in terms of avalanche and we, we triggered a number of avalanches, I think it was seven, uh, that we triggered ourselves over, over the course of about a month. And we didn't get very close at all. But on the way back, kind of looking at the fact that we weren't going to be able to climb this mountain, Mashable Meadows, we decided to do uh, some exploration and we did a longer trek and we went into a couple of other valleys. And one of those valleys we went into was the Characusa. Because I know um, that a number of people are watching from home uh, because, you know, we're all in, um, sheltered in place. Uh, with their, and a lot of people have told me that they're watching with their kids. I wanted to quickly talk about um, some of my experiences besides climbing in the Characusa Valley and in the in the Couche Valley. This is this picture shows coming down uh, into into the Couche Valley. Um, actually, this is going up the the top of the uh, Couche Valley into the Characusa. But this. Um, this area, this, this particular valley is home to three main villages, uh, Huche, Kande, and Haldi. And I've been here a number of times and have developed relationships with a number of the people there. Uh, this uh, is myself and one of my uh, friends, Doug Chabot, with a young boy named Fida. Uh, Fida is the son of Rasul, who we will talk about a, few a little bit later, who's one of the cooks I've worked with a lot. Another person I've worked with a lot as a, as a cook is this man, Fida, Fida Hussein. Fida is a, a great guy. He was a cook on a lot of expeditions for me, including uh, the, both the, the 2004 and 2005 Nanga Parbat uh, climbs. Fida has three sons. This is one of his sons, um, Abid uh, Hussein. And Abid is a really bright kid, and he's one of the – Myself and a couple of other uh, people have uh, helped uh, support the, the education of those three boys uh, throughout. In fact, now at this point, they're all graduated from university. Abid is a computer scientist, has a four-year degree in computer science. Uh, one of his brothers is an attorney, and uh, the third, third brother works in the medical field. So, for example, uh, here is... Um, slide to move. Here is uh, us in 2007 delivering uh, a beat's first computer to him. That's Marco Prezel and Vince Anderson. This was on a different expedition. But uh, some friends from Zama, Washington bought and donated this computer and then we brought it over. And that was uh, Beat's first, first computer. Here's uh, Marco giving him a, a lesson, his first uh, computer lesson. I'm sure Abid could give Marco a computer lesson at this point. Uh, Abid's education mostly involved uh, private boys' schools in the town of Skardu. This is one of the classrooms here where we visited. That's Vince there standing up in the foreground, and there's the teacher with the day's lesson. Uh, I wanted to t talk about this because, you know, we're all sheltered in place, and learning from home is a big, uh, you know, thing right now. Um, and uh, we are, are very fortunate to, to have some excellent educators and educational facilities in our country, and not everyone is as, as fortunate. And this is uh, what school looks like in some other places. This is another place, another school that's become very important to me in the past few years. And uh, this is a, a school uh, that uh, is in Kande, the village between Huche and Haldi. And uh, I first visited this school in 2003 and um, 
during that that trip and then also in subsequent um, trips starting in 2004, I started to contribute financially to the to the school. The main problem was that they didn't have funding to pay for uh, female teachers. And without female teachers, a lot of the villagers wouldn't send their girls to school because they didn't want their girls to be in co-ed classrooms. Um, so this was, uh, you know, that's part of the, the Muslim faith that's pro predominant in, this, in Pakistan. So um, I have uh, since 2004, myself and a couple of other people, including Scott Johnston and uh, the Shenards, Vaughn and Melinda Shenard, and a couple of other people have been contributing to their, to their funding, to the funding these two teachers. So that's been going on for about 16 years now that we've been funding those, those, uh, those teacher positions. And uh, these girls are just adorable, as you can tell. And what we're going for basically is reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, the very, their very more sort of basic level of education. Uh, want them to be able to, you know, obviously write, keep track of uh, expenditures and, and those kinds of things. Um, this area, they're pretty much living in a primarily a subsistence agriculture. You know, they, these people in this area mostly live in stone uh, houses that they build by themselves. They probably have like an electric light that's powered by a little hydro system, but that's about it. Um, these are two of the guys that are on the board of, uh, and the guy in the middle there is the sort of chairman of the board of the school. Uh, really, really nice guy, really generous guy. He keeps me informed as to what's going on at the school and sends me pictures. This is actually a recent picture just from a couple of months ago, him shoveling out uh, the snow from the playground. And um, this was the most recent graduation ceremony, or not, not graduation, but the years, uh, the graduation. These schools have to, um, pass sort of like we have the the teachers or the students take sort of these um i'm not thinking of the name right now not placement tests but sort of a grade level certifications as the as the girls go through each grade and these are their certificates they're passing their their grade level uh and this is a picture of one of the teachers who just had a baby last year that's her little baby uh who's this picture is about a year old now so the baby's a little bigger now so strong connections to this area and some important things going on besides just climbing. And uh, we'll go back into, this is, this is Con, um, the Conde village, which is just about, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, six or eight miles below the small village of Huche. And Huche is the, the highest village in, the, in this valley. And this is where you start walking to go into the Charcusa Valley. In the middle here, in the in the brown shawa, is Kamish is uh, Rasul, uh, my my main uh, cook on on this on this expedition, and uh, we basically just got loaded up and 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 uh, set up here and then w walked in. So just a little bit of quick background: we, had, Marco and Matiz and I had gone all the way out to Islamabad. I drew a trekking permit, which is a fifty dollar permit. Uh, then returned uh, to Skardu and then to Huche uh, with that permit in hand and then met Rasul here, had bought some groceries and so forth. And then we went in here. It's about a two day, not about, it's a two day walk. Some people stretch it into three from Huche up into the, to the base camp for the Charcus Valley. One of the nice things is it's, it's pretty close. Um, so a lot of people have asked me about my my budget and in the last presentation people were really surprised at how inexpensive my expeditions are and i i think that that's a really important point that i want to spend a little time on because these lightweight expeditions do not have to be uh that expensive um these uh these numbers here i just pulled out of my original notebook and so i just added did some quick addition this morning and added it up. So this expedition to the Charcusa cost me a total of $820. The only thing that wasn't in this list was this $50 permit fee. So $870 plus obviously the international airfare to, to get to Islamabad, to get to Pakistan. But uh, that was a three week expedition for one person. So 
doesn't really have to be that that expensive. You can see a lot of these things like you know the food in um, Stardew. These are these are groceries. So there's about you know 2,500 uh, rupees. Um, it's roughly 60 rupees to the dollar. So you know you can do the math. It's about 40 dollars in food for three weeks. Uh, you can see things like uh, my food during the drive to Skardu, I spent $2, 120 rupees. Um, of course, this is 2003 prices, so I'm sure it's more expensive now. But the point is that this is, is really not a very expensive uh, expedition and that people should not think that expedition climbing has to be incredibly expensive. Um, if you're just going there and doing your own climbing with one or two friends, you can go really light and you can go really cheap. Uh, we buy, well, you know, I've always bought my, my food and just like the local markets. I don't, the only thing I bring from home in regarding food is, is a little bit of climbing food, like performance type food that you might want. Um, and then certain things that might not, um, yeah, that's basically all, that's basically all I bring. The, old, the one thing I bring is I, I'll typically bring some sort of treat, whether it's, um, Chocolate doesn't travel well, so I'll often bring like uh, black licorice. I really like black licorice, something like that. That I'll uh, I'll bring plus you know some 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 mountain food. And that's it. That's all I bring. One of the good rules of thumb I want to share is uh, for lightweight expeditions is when you get to the airport, you should be able to pick up and carry everything at once by yourself. So to me, that's usually like a carry-on backpack. And two duffel bags you know that's uh that's if you need more than that you you you're not doing a lightweight expedition anymore um so this is uh this is kind of some of my my rules of thumb and some of my guidelines for, for pricing it's, it just doesn't have to be that expensive i can uh happily people can email me at the coach at uphill athlete email and i can put them in touch with good outfitters and um guides in pakistan and, and cooks and so forth um, and uh, there's a lot of great people over there. So, like I said, I've had in the repeatedly now. I've had a lot of great experiences with uh, with uh, Pakistani people in this in these northern areas. They're always really happy. They're incredibly honest. Um, I've had situations where I've accidentally overpaid porters and they've returned the money. I've had a, a situation where I, I left a Swiss Army knife sitting on the table. Um, where we were eating and then I came back the next morning and it was still sitting there, you know, in a lot of places, you know, that would be gone in less than 10 minutes. You know, these, these people are, are extraordinarily uh, honest and, and, uh, and uh, good people. And I've, I've really enjoyed uh, spending time with them. So one of the, one of the parts I like about traveling in Pakistan so much is that as you can see from this picture, um, you get to interact and know people, and they're open. You can see their faces. This is a we got the drum, drums out. This was the porters on our walk in, and we were kind of having. Uh, they had a kind of a sing along party. Uh, there's a couple other trekkers. You can see see this one other white guy there uh, sitting there, and so we kind of had a, had a nice evening. And they open up and they like let you participate. Um, and uh, that's how I felt going in there. You know, I basically like was embedded with these guys, like drinking tea out of the same pot and same cups and uh, sitting around with them and, you know, listening to them chat and joke. And, um, you know, I remember one of these times, like walking up here, that's Rasul in the, in the sort of blue purplish jacket there. And they were just blah, 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 blah. It's like, Rasul, what are you talking about? And he's like, oh, you know, we're talking about Muhammad's cow. <laughs> so you know like they they're always chattering and always energetic and always uh you know kind of feel like they have a good mood um you know and this is their life like they don't you know this is they don't have a lot but they're really happy and they're uh they're pretty content uh i want to point out muhammad there with the cup uh pouring the tea back in you know the reason he's pouring the tea back in is because he's mixing the sugar he's mixing the sugar and the milk into the tea and they don't have a spoon you know, they're mixing it with a cup. Um, you know, other people would be driven crazy that they don't have a spoon, right? But then they just find a workaround and you know, they don't have a, a, a fancy butane stove, but they push three rocks together and start some wood on fire. And you know, there you've got your, 
you know, a little stove to make your tea. So I really appreciate the simplicity of, of uh, life and traveling over here. It's been one of the better experiences I've had uh, anywhere traveling. So on this expedition, as I mentioned, I was just with Rasul. This is uh, Rasul. Rasul's kind of a famous uh, cook. He's uh, he's mostly retired now. Um, he's been he's been cooking for expeditions since, geez, at least the early, if not, and for sure the mid '80s. And uh, we got dropped off basically there in, in base camp. You can kind of see what base camp it looks like there. It's sort of this. Um, alluvial floodplain neck, right next to the glacier. There's a few little streams and, and plants and it's kind of a gravel bar area. It's a really, really nice base camp. My primary objective was to try to climb this mountain in, in the center here, which was an unnamed peak. Um, this is, I uh, forget the name, this is uh, Fati Brock and I forget what this one is called. Um, this is the husband peak and this is the wife and I uh, didn't know, Russell didn't know of a name for this mountain. I basically climbed, wanted to climb this line that goes up here, there's a snow and ice and mix line that went up here that I thought was really striking. Here's a little closer view of it from a little different angle, actually taken the following season, but uh, it was a little melted out. But um, I climbed up here and then there was quite some, some difficult climbing. I didn't climb this, this uh, ice streak is actually, I climbed the corner that is a, a little further left here and then up onto the shoulder. And then uh, this was a big flat area where I rested for quite a while and then I climbed up to the summit here. And then I descended by rappelling the same way. Had to, had to rappel all the, all the way. My base camp or my bivy was, uh, was just, sorry, I have a hard time seeing my screen. My bivy was just at the base of these rocks here. And here's that baby right here. You can see the base of the rocks. So I, I basically went over from our little base camp. I was already acclimatized because I'd been there all, all summer and climbing a masher broom. So I got right to work. I had good weather. I, this took me about three or four hours uh, to cross this big dry stone covered glacier, um, walk up here into this basin and I carved out a little spot to sleep. And um, that was my spot. This is where I where I climbed up in the morning. So I was I was <laughs> right at the base of my route, and I just kind of took care of. Uh, I got there, um, had time to do a little scouting and um, and uh, make myself a meal, and then I was I was ready to go. So not uh, much uh, preparation. I didn't know much about the route other than what I could see with a spotting scope from the ground. And uh, I woke up, I don't remember the details, they're all written down somewhere, but I believe I woke up at like midnight or one o'clock in the morning, something like that, and, uh, and uh, got going. The weather was still good in the morning. And my idea was, what the, the kind of idea I wanted to test with this climb was I wanted to see if I could climb uh, in this sort of what we call the single push style that we used in Alaska to climb for 24 plus hours. Um, and the advantage of that obviously is that you don't need to climb, you don't need to carry bivy gear. So I wanted to try to try to apply that style of climbing, but in a place where it gets dark at night. You can see in this picture actually there's a headlamp on my knee right there. So I had a headlamp uh, attach you know kind of put on each leg and um then i had a, a headlamp on my on my head obviously as well so for those of you that like the technical stuff i uh was using at this time uh we were not quite fully leashless we were using these leashes that would kind of clip on and off uh the ice tools this is a, a cable system that gravel used um, that was actually quite a good system. Uh, so that kind of dates it. This is 2003, so this is right at the end of the era of using leashes. Um, so not a whole lot of pictures when you're soloing. <laughs> this is taken kind of more or less at, at first light. Uh, another question I get regarding the gear is why I use the crampons with the, the pneumatic style crampons. Of course, these type binding systems have evolved a little bit since 2003, but the yellow, kind of plastic toe piece. And the reason is that it's just simply lighter than a metal toe bale. Um, you save about two ounces per crampon. 
uh, at that time. Uh, I was using, as you can see in this last picture, one of these pictures I was using, a, a, and this is still often what I prefer is a, a monopoint, um, single monopoint, vertical oriented. This is a crampon called the G14, but that's uh, my typical setup. I still uh, run something quite similar to that uh, all these years later. So, uh, so in the more as we got to uh, as the, as the sun came up, uh, I started. I found myself a couple. You know, this route was about 3,000 vertical feet, if I remember right, roughly 1,000 meters. And I got up, uh, the sun came up, uh, got some nice views of the, of the mountains. This is uh, Chogolisa right here. That's the main summit of Chogolisa, of course. Probably most famous because this is where the great alpinist Herman Boole uh, died with uh, Kurt Deenberger. Um, Herman fell through uh, a cornice. Kurt, Kurt Deenberger did not. Kurt Deenberger is actually still alive, um, though he's in his 80s at this point. Uh, met him just a few years ago. And uh, so again, apologize for the lack of, uh, of uh, great pictures. I was wearing a helmet, but I had taken it off just because I got so hot. Uh, and that tells you a little bit about how the conditions were. This was great climbing. It was sort of technical climbing, but pretty easy, mindless, just chugging. The route was laid out really well for this strategy because the easy climbing was all at the bottom. So I could do the easy climbing in the, in the dark. And then it kicked up into some pretty hard climbing. And as I recall, there was about six pitches that I rope soloed that were quite technical. They were good climbing. It was sort of this big chimney that had, you know, had some rotten rock in the back, you can kind of see there. But um, there's good rock on the sides and the, the rotten rock had kind of eroded and left a nice kind of chimney stemming corner feature. And there were some blobs of ice here and there. And uh, this was a little bit slow because I was, uh, rope soloing and I would have to also go down and, and rappel down and clean every pitch. Um, this is looking down from probably looks like one of my anchors looking down before going and cleaning one of my pitches. I was climbing on a half rope of 60 meter, uh, eight, 8.5 millimeter rope if I remember right. Uh, remember those, you know, you remember a specific rope. That was an excellent rope. I, I had that rope, that set of ropes for a while. And here's another, picture looking down from a little perch where I got a rest and uh, you know this kind of rope soloing isn't super secure you're kind of basically uh, climbing on I climbed on what's called a, a clove hitch system where you just basically give yourself a big loop of like say 10 or 20 feet of oh uh, you look and think okay there's another rest up there so you give yourself say 20 feet of, uh, of uh, rope to think you can get to that rest 20 feet higher and you're leading but at any point you're going to take a big whip it's not like a great uh, super secure system so but but quite some cool technical climbing i really was enjoy and did enjoy the climbing and beautiful rock um there's some really nice rock in this valley uh there's this this route wasn't as good as some of the stuff on k7 that you'll see later but it was it was not not bad at all this was the last pitch I belayed because I got up to the base of this ice tongue and got in some good screws and then had to lead up this last pitch that you can see, a really beautiful ice pitch. That, and this actually got me up to the shoulder. Um, I, I didn't climb uh, out over here. This ice runnel actually went kind of bent back left and took me over this way. Uh, this thing actually was a little bit, I was a little bit concerned with that thing falling on me. Um, but once I got up higher, I could see it wasn't as threatening as I, I had thought. Um, I used to use, uh, you know, this little watch on my harness quite a bit. And this is how I would remember the, the times for later. I would take pictures of the watch. And so there it is about almost five o'clock in the afternoon. And I don't remember now where this picture was taken. I believe it was on the shoulder. I don't believe this was on the summit, but I believe this is kind of the end of the fire climbing. The summit of this mountain was really gorgeous. I got up to the shoulder and there was this beautiful little granite tower up into the sky. And I was, I took off my crampons and climbed up there. Um, and I left, uh, I left something on the summit. I can't remember what, if it was a sling to rappel down or piton or what, but um, it was nice technical climbing, like five, eight technical climbing, scrambling up onto this, this really, really cool little summit that you couldn't even stand on just kind of, sat there and uh, I went up there kind of just looked around 
and came back down to this shoulder because the shoulder was quite a nice hangout. And I was, I was quite tired and I needed to eat and hydrate a little bit. Um, and the views were quite spectacular from up here. This is looking at K7. This is the pictures, I these are the pictures I took on that, from that shoulder. Um, at this point, to give you an idea, at this point in 2003, the only summit to have been climbed in this whole picture was this one, the main summit of K7. And that um, had been climbed, now I'm forgetting the year. Um, hmm. I wanna say 1990. Um, but it could have been earlier by a, a Japanese expedition uh, of a bunch of uh, guys. I think there was 18 of them. And uh, every other summit in this picture was untouched. This is the summit of Linksar. This was just climbed um, in 2019. This is the summit of K7 West. So Vince Anderson and Marco Prizel and I climbed this in 2007. Um, uh, Rafael Slowinski and Kevin Mahoney, I think, climbed this peak. Um, I can't remember what year that was. They did that. And otherwise, I believe these other summits still are unclimbed. The main one that's interesting is this one, uh, which, which there's definitely some good routes to, to attempt there. And then this kind of intermediate middle summit of K7 is also really cool. This is all Sarax. It's exceedingly dangerous. So do not think that you can approach from up here because this is all threatened by big ice, ice Sarax. Um, but there's probably a way, way to do it. Vince and uh, Marco and I climbed, I believe, up here um, to climb when we climbed K7 West. And there's been some other uh, routes established, particularly on this buttress. Um, this has a name now, somebody's something cap. I forgot what they called it. Um, but anyway, so, so beautiful spot, beautiful spot. This is looking more to the north. Again, this is Chogalisa. This is the really beautiful mountain I'm going to talk about quite a bit called Naserbrock. And the only route that had been climbed on this at this time was this little ridge that comes up from the back here. Um, I did the first ascent of this ridge with uh, Steve Swenson and I forget who else was with there's three of us. Marco. Marco Prezel. And then Marco and Vince and I climbed, I don't remember where we started at the bottom here, but we climbed probably somewhere over here. We climbed, did the first ascent of this route. And then Marco and Vince and I climbed this, and we wanted to get to this summit, but we didn't get that far. I can't remember which one we got to, if we got to this one or this one. That was in 2007. And then um, uh, Conrad Anker and Peter Croft, I think, climbed this ridge. I don't remember what year. They did that, at least that's my understanding. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of beautiful little spires in here. I'll show you more pictures of some of this stuff later. This is looking down a little more to the west, and this, of course, is Masherbrum here. Um, really, really impressive mountain. And this is K2, the, the king of the Karakoram. I think one of the most beautiful mountains in the, in the world, for sure. So when you come up from Huche, Huche is down in here, and you come up the valley here, and walk along here in base camps out of the view here. Looking the other way, looking to the south, is this really beautiful peak called Drifica, which is about 6,500 meters, um, just under. I think you can do that on a trekking peak. The most difficult part of climbing Drifica is actually getting through this ice fall, which you skirt on the, on the right, the climber's right. And people usually make a high camp up in here and climb this ridge. It's moderately technical. I've been very, very, I've been within 50 meters of that summit, but didn't quite get to the top. This is what's, this wall over here is in the, the Nangma Valley, which is the next uh, parallel valley to the, to the south. And if you just look, shift slightly to the left, the viewer is left, you see here's that Nangma Valley wall. Now we're looking at Kapura Peak. This was unclimbed then and in 2004, I'll tell that story in the next installment. Uh, Steve Swenson and, and Doug Chabot and I made the first ascent of that and Marco Prezel and, and, and Bruce Miller summited it the very next day. Um, and then of course, K6. This is the west summit of K6 here, the main summit of K6. Back here was had been climbed, I think I remember right, it was in the 70s, 73, 77. And this, this west summit wasn't climbed until a few years ago when Ian Walsh and, and Rafael Slowinski climbed that. Don't remember what year that was, probably, probably roughly about 10 years ago or so. 
So uh, this is a picture on the left of me when I came down from, this is when I got back to my bivy. I'd been on the go about uh, 23 hours, a little less than 24 hours. And I show this picture in this collage because uh, those two pictures are taken basically two days apart. <laughs> and I think in my face, you can see that a transformation has been made. If not in my face as well, my eyes, like my face is actually hollowed out a little bit. And I have quite the, quite the, uh, quite the thousand yard stare um, going there. And those, those pictures are just a couple of days apart. So this was a, a, a big drawdown for me, um, took a lot out of me, but it also gave me a lot of, and what it gave me was a belief in myself that I could uh, do this kind of climbing by myself in this kind of environment, which, you know, in the Karakoram, um, far away from, from any other people is a, is a pretty, pretty re as remote as it gets, pretty much. So, um, well, I guess you can get more remote, but uh, we're on. Um, climbing out there by yourself, no one's going to come and get you. So I came back to base camp with Rasul and had a few rest days. It's a, this base camp is really a gorgeous little place. There's, there's, you can see up behind Rasul's shoulder there, there's, those boulders are actually, have some really nice bouldering on them. It'd be worth bringing a bouldering pad if you could afford it uh, to fly it over there. Um, there's some fun, great, great quality rock. There's, there's dozens of boulders here. Um, and, uh, it's just a nice place to hang out. It's about 14,000 feet high. It's not, so it's not super low, but not incredibly high. You can get it back there. Um, and Rasul would make me these awesome breakfast. I ate a lot of pancakes. You can see just the left of the, of the thing, of the box here that my, was my table, this little radio. We had a shortwave radio. We could get the BBC World Service on there. Uh, we'd listen to some, some stories on the BBC. Um, a couple other things that are important. I like, Rasul would always bring fresh flowers and have them in. And then this is another thing, this jar, some of you will recognize this if you've been to Pakistan. This is this, this is this hot chili, pickled chilies that they have over there that are just divine, really, really good. Uh, kind of a chutney kind of a thing, kind of hard to describe. So we then entered a little period of bad weather and I spent some days with Rasul, just kind of we'd get out of the tent, go for hikes when we had these little breaks in the storm. Uh, there's a lot of ibex in this valley. It was actually really cool. We saw quite a few of them. We, we'd see their tracks around and uh, that was fun. They're really cool animals. And then um, we'd, uh, we had a couple times where we got way up into the valley and uh, got into some, get this, the weather kind of closed in on us like this day. Uh, and then we had some other days that were, were really beautiful. The, the high peaks stayed pretty plastered and you can see there's some fresh snow on the glacier. Um, so we would travel around, uh, roped up. Uh, I felt that some responsibility to take care of Rasul. He, he's not a climber or a mountaineer per se. Um, and it was really nice of him to do these extended hikes with me up on the glacier and get up and look around. Um, and then in places, the, the glacier was just dry and, and not snow covered. It was just bare ice and we could walk around. Uh, absolutely stunning place. I mean, those rock walls there are just fantastically beautiful. A lot of people ask me how I know where I'm going, especially in, in this era. I, this was, these were all slides, actually. I didn't have, di this is pre-digital camera, or not pre-digital cameras, but I did not have a digital camera at this time. And uh, they weren't very good in 2003. So um, mostly I would use this little spotting scope, a uh, little mini telescope, and I also had a pair of binoculars. So I would do a lot of looking uh, through these things and even looking at different times of day and different light conditions. Um, I had, uh, on this expedition, I didn't have any, but generally I would have like some printouts of, uh, of pictures of the mountains so I could kind of trace some ideas and lines and that's how it kind of keep oriented and um, figure out where to go. So um, this is our whole base camp here. You can see on one of these bad weather days and it's uh, while we were in this sort of period, I, this was after, climbing um, what I called Haji Brock, the unnamed peak I called Haji Brock. And I named Haji Brock for Rasul. Haji is the name of a person who's been on the Hajj. Every Muslim is supposed to go on the Hajj, which is the, the holy pilgrimage to Mecca. 
uh, once in their lifetime. And Rasul was getting to the, had just gotten to the point where that previous year he had been able to go on the Hajj. And so for a, a, a man of his economic um, means, that was a, a huge accomplishment. And he was actually the first person in his village, if not in the whole valley, to, to do the Hajj. So he was, um, he was getting a lot of uh, respect from his, his fellow uh, neighbors and so forth for being able to, to put that together to get over there. Um, so I named that kind of in, in his honor, uh, the ha Haji Rock. I named that peak. Um, I don't know if that's an official name, but that's what I refer, it's been hopefully referred to as. So I started to pack up for what I wanted to do next, which was explore the climbing around K7, because from the summit of, of Haji Brock, I had seen all these amazing potential. And K7, even though it was the one peak that had been climbed before, it was super striking. Um, another thing I want to say is like something I've done throughout all my expeditions is, is journaling. And I just took this picture this morning. I had to dig out the journals to sort of remember um, the order of operations and what happened uh, on all these different trips. And uh, uh, I, on my expeditions, I'm a pretty big journaler. It's one of my main uh, kind of modes of, of entertainment. And I uh, often, I think of expeditions sort of as these, um, as these retreats in a way. Um, so I spend a lot of time reading and writing uh, when, I'm, when I'm on expeditions, especially when you're by yourself. So uh, a lot of this information I've, I had to go in and verify and remember with those expeditions. So um, like I said, I wanted to try K7, but this is, as you can see, an incredibly complicated mountain. I didn't even know where to start. Um, and I just want to point out that the Japanese, I believe, had climbed this big snow couloir here up to this shoulder. They had traversed here, gone up some sort of chimney systems here that were full of ice, gone up here climbed, I believe, and I could be wrong, so don't, like, you know, might have to check original sources, but then they climbed up this big corner system, and then kind of came up through here, and then traversed somewhere through here, I'm not sure exactly where, get onto this hanging glacier, and then up through here. Um, that was, I, I didn't know exactly where they had gone um, because I didn't really have information at all in this expedition. I didn't have American Alpine Journal or anything like that. I just knew that it, the mountain had been climbed before. That was all I knew. So on my kind of hiking around explorations with, with Rasul, we had seen this incredible waterfall line on the, this is the east face of K7 that takes you up to this shoulder. And I was kind of obsessed with that. I thought that is the most beautiful, coolest looking waterfall I've ever seen. So that was my first objective as I went to try to climb that uh, solo. I got up there and I actually got up here in the dark. I think I got basically just below this rock and I could just hear this was just running with water. It was so noisy from all the water coming down. It wasn't cold enough. Um, I knew that there was this hole, this piece of ice missing, but I was hoping I could find a way around it or, or maybe that there'd be some you can kind of see there might be a chimney system behind here that would get me to this and then this would connect to that and so on. Um, but when I got up here in the dark and heard all the water and knew that it wasn't freezing, uh, I just came back down and then waited for the sunrise and then took this picture and I went back to camp. So that was attempt number one. <laughs> Thumbs down. Didn't work out. Okay, so back to the drawing board. So uh, the next thing I tried was where I had this marked number one. Uh, I thought I was looking basically for, you know, thinking strategically, I was looking for places where I could climb quickly lower on the mountain. And I didn't, wasn't going to just like bust up like these rock towers, you know, that was going to be slow climbing. I was looking for lines of weakness. So number two is where I ultimately climb, but my first attempt, my next attempt, uh, attempt number two was up, up through here um, where that's number one is. Here's a, a little uh, tighter picture of that. Um, this didn't seem to be threatened by Serax. This glacier is, is, is had the snow sloughing off of it because it's steep, but there's no real Serax in here. And also here, the Serax um, are pretty mild in this year. Uh, in subsequent trips, particularly in 2007, when I was here again, the end of this was a giant threatening Serac that threatened this whole basin. But when I was here in 2003, um, the, the Seracs were quite benign. So here's another, another picture from the glacier level of, of heading up into here. And I thought, oh, this might you know, provide a quick and easy uh, 
entrance into this this little valley and then I can get up somewhere here. So my first my next attempt, I, I went up into that little valley. This is where the 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 snow and and uh, up the valley, up the glacier and then up into this kind of cleft. You can see this wet streaks of rock. You'll see in the next picture too. So I get higher, got up into there. This was all pretty wet, so I kind of climbed up a little higher until I found these nice little ice runnels. And then what I imagined, so it all got steep in here, but I found this nice ice runnels. And then I was looking at this corner system here, which one looked moderate and blocky uh, compared to the other options. <clears throat> And two, it was dry. Um, there was still quite a few, there is quite a bit of wet rock in here. It doesn't see a lot of sun. So I, I went up the, the ice. Um, that was actually really, really fun, joyful climbing. Then um, got up to the rock. This is actually the picture of where I turned around on the rock. I was trying to get left over here into this corner, but I couldn't quite get into it. They just the systems didn't connect without traversing around these little buttresses. And as you can see, the rock is good. Um, there's a little bit of lichen on it, but it's relatively clean. So I tried to climb up this crack into this blocky corner, hoping that I could get up here and sort of find a way to traverse through to get left there. But when I got up into this, uh, this, was all, this was all super slimy back in here. And I had to use this a little bit. And I kind of got stemmed out in here and got scared and uh, backed off. And I took this little picture of my disgruntled self. You can see though, it's like pretty warm. Like um, I'm not wearing a hat, I'm sweating a little bit from the climbing and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not particularly cold right now. So this was August, the month of August, uh, 2003. I actually uh, remember because my birthday is in August and I remember spending my birthday here. So then, then, then I rappelled back down. This is a different rope. This was a, just a, a static tag line that I had, just a 50 meter piece of uh, static six mil that actually Marco, I believe, had left with me. Um, and I rappelled, did a number of, short enough, I just did a bunch of short rappels back down to, um, to the ground. You can see where I could climbed up, right? Kind of like through this crack system and up this little corner into here. And then I think just around the corner here somewhere was where I had been turned around. So I got back down to the bottom of uh, the glacier there and it actually sort of started to snow as you can see. One of these sort of squalls came through and I was pretty disheartened and I walked back down to the main glacier. And it got sunny again. So I walked up the glacier, just looking around, trying to figure out, looking, trying to, trying to solve the problem of how to get through there. I found this chimney system and this, I'd actually found another chimney system just left of here and I'd kind of investigated and climbed up just, I don't know, like maybe 50, 100 feet, 25 meters or something. I can't, can't really remember. And it was just wet and not very nice. And then I, I found this sort of chimney system and I started to climb up here and it was actually quite good. And one of the things that had attracted me was this, this really pretty, solid, good, clean rock here. I thought, oh, okay, this, this looks promising, having good rock. I, I didn't climb up the slab. I think I probably climbed up behind here. I don't really, don't actually remember. Um, and uh, this, this took me way up in there. And I climbed up in there and I didn't, have, didn't go very far before I started to find some old anchors. And I didn't know who these were from. I didn't know if these were from the Japanese or whom they were from. But later I learned, and then up higher, I started to find the old fixed rope. Later I learned that these were from, a, I believe, a Kiwi, a New Zealand climber in Dai Lam Park, who had actually attempted the, this climb staying on the buttress, I believe, four times. Um, and so some of this stuff was left, left from him. So I was uh, soloing up, I had my little my rock shoes. Uh, it was warm weather, the sun was out, it was quite enjoyable. And this was actually a really cool experience. Didn't have really a backpack, I just, was, I just had a little bit of climbing gear. And um, you can see his old fixed line hanging down there. So I was like, okay, this has been climbed before. And it was real blocky, it wasn't super exposed. So I'd climb basically like a pitch, um, you know, and then, there, and then there'd be a little ledge and I could, have a break from the exposure and then climb sort of another pitch. It was real, mentally, it was real accessible in that way. It wasn't just like a thousand meter vertical like L cap style 
uh, big wall that you're free climbing on even at a moderate level. Uh, the hardest climbing was about 6A, 510, easy 510. Um, and that was really only one section that was, I don't know, like maybe, maybe 10, 15 meters, 30, 40 feet of sort of proper 510 climbing. Uh, and most of it was much easier, 5A, little 5.9 climbing. Um, you can kind of see here where the rope comes up. Uh, you know, there's nice cracks. This is Dye's old rope. Good clean rock. And here's some bushes and grasses and stuff. You can kind of stem around that. Um, really where the rock is good, you can see it's quite, quite solid. So a lot of, a lot of easy scrambly climbing. Um, this is rappelling back down, uh, you know, over this, over these little, uh, sections. But, uh, so that slide was out of order, but this got uh, me onto this shelf. And this shelf was probably about, I can't remember now, but probably about three or 400 no, probably more than that, probably five or 600 meters, like maybe 1,500 feet above the glacier. This is looking down the glacier and base camp would be just out of view kind of over here on the side of the glacier. So um, when I got to this point, um, I felt like I had cracked the code because this got me to this middle hanging glacier that I'd showed you before. And I just saw, look, was able to look up that and was like, oh yeah, that's just a bunch of, 40 to 55 degree snow covered glacial ice and I can definitely solo that no problem. So I was all fired up I went back down to base camp and I got packed up. I wasn't really sure on the best uh, um, strategy and strategy is, is really important with this stuff. So what I had done was I, I picked sort of what I would consider a, a middle strategy. It was, uh, as my wife says, it wasn't not fish, not meat. It's something kind of in between. And what that meant, well, what I mean by that is I picked a strategy where I didn't really, wasn't really equipped to bivy, but I did have a bivy sack and a stove and fuel. You know, from the, ba from the base of the route uh, to the summit was, I don't recall now, but it's, it's um, I should actually look this up. I'll look it up for the next talk. But um, like 7,000 vertical feet, 8,000 vertical feet, like almost 3,000, like 2,500 meters of climbing. I couldn't quite wrap my head around doing that all one push without at least a nap. So I was borrowing from some of the strategies we used in the Alaska thinking, okay, I'll nap, but it's a little colder here that, than it is, not during the day, but at night it's, a, it's cold, it can be cold. In Alaska, we do the napping during the daylight hours in the sun, right? So it's pretty warm. Here, I wasn't sure of that strategy. So I brought a bivy sack, I brought a stove and a fuel canister and stuff. Uh, climbing gear, this was uh, one of the, this is not this attempt, this was a later attempt, but this is roughly the, the kind of climbing gear I brought. What I don't show here is I had a couple of ice screws as well. So, um, and I also brought some, I had different slings from time to time. You can see that yellow, you'll see that yellow cordelette get left, you'll see that sling get left. You'll see that piece of blue um, uh, lightweight webbing get, get left somewhere uh, for repels. So basically for, I'm trying to free solo as much as I can, I'm 99, free solo 99% of it. And then um, I had to eight climb a tiny amount of it, about 10 meters of it. And then, so I'm free soloing basically all the time without protection. I'm using the gear for the repels for coming down. So I'm using V-threads, um, and there's a video on how to make a V-thread on the YouTube channel, and I'll put the YouTube channel. And um, there is, uh, uh, otherwise I'm using the pitons for, and the nuts for repels where, where I need to. So I got some good weather and I got the thumbs up to go and try this, uh, this attempt. So I, I started up and I would use my watch and this little altimeter. I don't know where this is on the route now, I don't remember, but you can see it's about, uh, 1225 and, and almost a little past noon and I'm at about 4,600 meters. I think the base of the route was around 4,400 meters if I remember right. So in this scenario I had you can see I had the sleeping pad. I have my crampons on the top of that pack. Um, that's what's in that little bag um, and I'm trailing that little static line and then just hand over hand pulling my my rope up uh, to pull my little pack up. Uh, there behind me. Um, 
I've got mostly my boots on my clip to my harness because they don't haul very well. So you can see how I have my boots clipped to my harness. Those are regular double boots that at that time they're called the, the La Sportiva Nupse, um, which was a, a warm uh, technical climbing double boot. And then I would, I would uh, just tag my um, little backpack up. When I got to the, that shelf, I left the rock climbing shoes and I switched to the boots and crampons and ice tools and started up that, that glacier. You can see there's a little bit of fresh snow on the glacier. And this is actually looking down that gut where I tried to climb up on the first attempt. That would have, I would have put myself coming up right here had I been able to make that go. So, uh, Climbing up this this snow snowy icy stuff, this kind of snow freshly snow cover, fresh snow covered glacier is generally pretty easy climbing. Um, you can see just by the snow. Those of you that are are used to this kind of environment, that snow is actually quite warm. Um, I was there's the bench. Here we go. So here's where I made my first attempt coming up this drainage. Here's where I made my more recent attempt, and it got me onto this bench here and then this is where I left my rock shoes actually I left my rock shoes down here somewhere and I let I, sh I shifted to the crampons right here and have been just soloing up along here so easy moderate climbing pretty fast uh good going uh good ice there underneath so you can you can see there and starting to get some altitude here now this is there's that, there's where I came up just down there. And this tower here is kind of a landmark you'll see in some of these other pictures. There's that tower. There's the towers and here's, here's where I came up from. So now I'm getting some, some elevation here. Now, as I get a little higher, there's those towers and I can look down into this Serac filled sort of canyon uh, down on that side. I'm starting to get some real exposure here. Um, this was what most of the climbing was like. It was mostly pretty moderate, and then it would have these short sections of sort of what I think of as almost like bouldering, like this little section here. This doesn't look like much, but this is, an, this is sort of an ice-filled, snow-filled crack. It's kind of steep, like if you, if you fall off mantling up over this little horn, you're, you're going to go to the bottom of the mountain. It wasn't sustained, difficult climbing, um, but there was sections where um, you were definitely uh, worried about uh, falling off you know um, this was getting me up onto the nose of this next glacier this kind of pretty moderate uh, mixed climbing just sort of weaving following my nose going going what looked like the easiest way the, the ice here now that we're at a little higher elevation is becoming pretty cold and pretty brittle um, so I I got up uh, higher there and uh, I actually found this sort of cave in this uh, Serac and decided to take advantage of a nice, the first real nice place to uh, lay down that I'd seen in quite some time and, and take, uh, eat some food and, and make some water and so forth. This is the view looking out of that little, that little cave. And here's my little setup. So I stopped in the late afternoon. I'd have to look at my journals and see if I could find what time, but it doesn't matter. But while I was sitting here, it actually started snowing. Um, so in the end, I spent the whole night in this little snow cave uh, because it snowed all night. And I wasn't in any danger. It was actually quite a secure little place. Uh, I had a roof over my head, uh, but I, would, I was pretty cold. I didn't have a sleeping bag. I just had that little bivy sack and the Das Parka. So particularly my legs got cold. My upper body was actually okay. So I would doze off. I'd get really cold. I'd have to wake up. I'd sort of stand up and do some squats and get warmed up. Maybe I had one canister of fuel. And at some point I realized I wasn't going to... Um, be going too much higher in the morning. So I started to make more hot drinks for myself to kind of just get through the night with some comfort. Woke up in the morning and, and went out there and it's just snowing, lots of spin drift coming down the, the, the mountain. And it was clear that that was the end of my, my attempt. Um, I actually uh, show you where I was right here. So I'd come up, come up here, come up here. This is that sort of moderate mixed climbing that I was talking about with the little boulder steps and then my cave was right in here and then I come this way in the white out I came up a little higher and then descended down through here I descended down I'll show you in another picture I descended down through there for a reason this actually uh, shows it a little more close up um, 
my this is where my little snow cave was under this little serac here so i come up in here this actually had some pretty steep climbing pretty pretty much vertical ice climbing right here to get up through there and then i found the, the cave right after that i didn't know this cave was here but i figured i was aiming for this bear trend i figured i'd find a snow cave in this bear trend where i could i could rest but anyway i came here i i climbed down underneath this edge and I made my first rappel from that ice right there. Kind of followed this ramp down here, down here, and then followed this big corner system down through here. This I actually had to, I thought I could just down climb, but in this, on this day I, I made some rappels because there was a lot of spin drift and I was un, a little unsure of myself until I got down to the Bergstrom and then from there I could down climb. The rest of the way. Uh, I did a lot of down climbing this day. Here's uh, here's some of those first. Here's I think this is actually the first rappel I did. Um, it's hard to know from these sl slides that are so old. And then this is this is the you can see that one of those slings. This is with the, with the steeper rappels in the rock. Again, I'm making pretty short rappels. I only have 50 meters of, of skinny rope, six millimeter static line. So I've got to make pretty short rappels. But uh, I'm able to to get my way make my way uh, down there. This is the last rappel off the rock. You can see my tracks there, I actually had rappelled first down here and then kind of kept myself on rappel to get, get over. Um, then as I got lower, it, it had cleared up. So I had uh, rappelled from in there and it was coming out and you can see my, my tracks there. I got on down to the to the rock, put my rock shoes back on just because they were easier to maneuver around in my boots. It had stopped uh, raining and snowing by now, and uh, I was able to just I was able to kind of take a lot of these old ropes from Dai and reconfigure them and uh, repel with just a couple of carabiners. Uh, a regular repel device wouldn't work on these ropes; they're so old and stiff, but they were good enough to get me down. So I got back down and, uh, you know, I, I was actually like feeling pretty good. Um, there, somebody asked about uh, my ice axes there. You can see I have two ice axes. Uh, I didn't get to the summit, but I had a really cool adventure. I got really high on the mountain. I got, you know, it's almost 7,000 meter peak of 6,942 meters. And I got up around, I, I believe 6,300. So less than 2,000 feet to the top out of a big climb. So I was feeling really good about that um, and um, was, was pretty excited. I, I had potentially time for another attempt, but uh, that did not happen. Uh, we entered another period of bad weather uh, for about another week, and then I was kind of out of time and headed out. So um, that's my, my story about uh, starting. There's our, our two tents at base camp with, with the K6 massif in the background. And uh, this picture is actually uh, not mine. This was taken the following year in 2004 by, by Marco Prezel. So uh, a little bit, of, uh, but, uh, but the same exact base camp and probably the same exact tents. And um, that concludes my, my story about the, the 2003 attempts on, on K7. Uh, I came back in, in 2004 and did some more climbing and talk about that next week. And until then, I really appreciate everyone joining me for the story time. And I want everyone to uh, try to remember that, that quote at the beginning and whether it's just getting through the, the, the COVID-19 crisis pandemic or whether you're watching this years from now and, and you're going through something, there's always uh, you... As the, as the quote said, you have the tools to weather this storm and to get through this crisis and we will all come out better and stronger and wiser and we're going to do that together. So thank you very much.